So we'll start our series of seminars. And today we have Andrzej Dragan from Faculty of Physics of the Warsaw University. Andrzej is a well-known uh, scientist, science popularizer, but also photographer known among, uh, in between for such things like uh, the so-called Dragon's effect. You can uh, type it in the browser, but please, after this talk, you can read about Andrzej also in Wikipedia in several languages, but I think not in English. He's working on uh, special relativity, quantum information, and uh, well, we had the pleasure to, to listen uh, to Andrzej last academic year and also during our uh, conference on the occasion of 40th anniversary of CFT, still at the suggestion of Professor Ivo Białynicki Birula, uh, we have asked Andrzej uh, to talk again. So we are testing his creativity in the choice of the title and the content. And the title of this talk is zero equals to infinity minus infinity. So please. Actually, you got it wrong. The title is, let me show it. Perhaps it's going to, the title is zero equals infinity plus infinity. And let me maybe proceed with, with this uh, uh, before you kill me for, for saying an obvious nonsense here. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and feel like home already in CFT. Uh, uh, I, it, it reminds me of my presence at that when I was an undergrad student, the presence at the electrodynamics course tutorials, when I, uh, I was the only volunteer who wanted to solve problems at the blackboard. And at some point after I finished solving a problem, I didn't even go to sit down. I just waited for another one to, to be given and I essentially st st stood up and solved all the problems. And I, I stopped going to that group when I realized that the, um, the person who was actually giving this the, the course, uh, the, the tutorials, didn't know how to solve these problems. And why, when I declined my, uh, my voluntary uh, presence at the Blackboard, then she, she didn't know how to carry on. So anyway, uh, I'm going to, to, to talk about something uh, that's, that is my kind of, kind of topic of interest for the past several years, which is uh, to, to put together relativity with quantum theory. And in this case, it's, uh, I'm going to discuss something that sounds like a paradox, but it's actually a straightforward, very simple and mathematically simple consequence of, of uh, uh, elementary rules of quantum field theory. So let me, uh, um, I'm going, I'll be drawing on the board. So uh, uh, I'm going to, to, to go back to the old fashioned style of, uh, presentations. So let me consider a simple scenario in which we have a space-time diagram. Well, essentially, this is to present something very straightforward. So imagine we have a single cavity, a one-dimensional cavity uh, that is put at rest. So these are the two mirrors. We can consider Dirichlet boundary conditions, which means that all solutions inside the cavity are, can be decomposed into countable family of modes. These modes look like this, for example. This is the basic mode. We have uh, the first, the second mode just looks like this. There is a third mode, a fourth mode, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then any state of the field inside the cavity can be decomposed into those modes and the basis of modes is countable. We can denote those modes with uh, capital U. It depends on X and T. And we will consider the, the simplest possible scenario in which the cavity is completely empty which means that the state of the cavity is so-called quantum vacuum. And that means that the occupation of each of the modes is, is thus the vacuum. There is no excitations in any of these modes. And I would like to consider a very simple question. We know that the whole box is completely empty. Well, at least as empty as it can be due, according to the quantum field theory. But what about the half of the box? Is half of the box also empty? And the reason I am asking this question is that the answer is negative. Half of the box is not empty. And this is what I'm going to discuss uh, and look at the consequences of this weird statement. So what do we mean by saying that half of the box is not empty? Well, first of all, we can perform an experiment, a thought experiment, which involves an extra mirror that is placed in the exact middle of the cavity. So suppose I slam in an extra mirror at some point, and it divides the cavity into two halves, one half on the left, one half on the right. And just before that operation, the cavity was empty. The question is, what's going to happen if I slam the mirror down? 
And uh, this is an example of one of two cases in which quantum theory gives you exact solutions to the time evolution, at least uh, more or less uh, uh, exact. So, in, as you know, it's very difficult to, to, to discuss quantum evolution because it usually involves uh, Bison series of some sort of uh, some sort of perturbation theory, and you can only solve the dynamics uh, order by order to some approximation. But there are two cases when you can solve it exactly. One case is when your evolution is adiabatic, which means it's very, very, very slow. If I evolve my system very, very slow, if I change the potential in which I carry my system or evolve the system uh, with very slowly varying Hamiltonian, then essentially nothing interesting happens. And if I had uh, my, my, my cavity in the vacuum state and I've moved it very slowly or I introduced the mirror, but very, very slowly, the cavity will remain empty. That's the adiabatic theorem. Another type of evolution that can be solved exactly is when the evolution is rapid, when something changes very, very quickly. And in that case, I can also solve uh, exactly what's going to happen. And that's the case I'm going to consider next. And unfortunately, anything in between is very hard to solve. It's very difficult to say what's going to happen if I increase the barrier, increase the meter uh, in a finite time, but that time is neither slow nor fast. And in that case, I'm really uh, doomed to use some sort of perturbation theory or some approximations. But I'm considering the case of very rapid ascension of the meter. And in that case, the procedure is straightforward. So what you need to do is you need to con consider the new boundary conditions because now the field has to vanish on this meter, it has to vanish on this meter, and it also has to vanish on this meter here, which means that the modes that are allowed in the cavity are now separated in two solutions, two, two families, one family is on the left-hand side and the other family is on the right-hand side. And I have, again, straightforward decomposition into modes, and I'm, I can call these modes uh, u, small u of x and t, and small u with a bar x and t. And now the question is, what will be the state of the cavity after the whole operation? And the paradigm, how to compute that, uh, the, the state of the cavity after the, the middle has been introduced is very straightforward. What I need to do is I need to express those modes, the capital U modes, in terms of the small modes. And that, that the composition uh, corresponds to the composition of the annihilation and creation operators of these capital U modes, and the creation and annihilation operators of the modes of the, of the half of the cavity. So that means that uh, uh, I could uh, perform that decomposition, that is called Bogelio transformation, and I'm going to do it in a second, to compute the exact state of the cavity. However, let me make one observation already. So suppose that uh, uh, I am only interested in the state of the cavity in one of the halves, in this part of the cavity, which means that I have to compute the overall state and then trace out the degrees of freedom I'm not interested in. And in this case, I have to compute the overall state, which is the ground state of the cavity, and trace over the modes U bar. That will give me the density matrix of the state on the left-hand side. I just need to trace out the state on the, on the right-hand side. And one observation is that if I start with a pure state, that operation will leave me with a mixed state in general. And obviously, that mixed state cannot be vacuum. So this is the first hint that if I trace out part of the space, spatial degrees of freedom that I'm not observing, then the remaining part will not be vacuum. That means there will be some particles inside that part of the cavity. So that already means that the, the very idea of tracing out some part of space out of your physical picture that you observe already leaves you with some particle creation effect. And that's what, I'm, what I mean by saying that half of the empty box is not necessarily empty. Which is an interesting observation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I hope you are aware that more than 25 years ago, there was a series of papers just stating exactly this and calculating the state in the half box. 
I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out of one of these papers, not necessarily 25 years ago, but uh, I'm sure this has been approached in many different ways. And uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest you look at the paper that we have written with Marco Cirone about 25 years ago, yes. about exactly the same problem. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. What I hope uh, is that uh, I will be able to add a little bit to that observation. With, sure, with, sure, sure, sure. So, I, I not... Yes. So, so, yes, this has been looked in many, many ways. Like, so, actually, there is a whole formulation of quantum field theory that is called algebraic quantum field theory, in which, by definition, you have constructions of local algebras in every point of space. And by construction, you can see that uh, what I just said is actually obvious. It's nothing, uh, n nothing unusual. So I'm sure this has been studied in many various various contexts, but I, I still hope that uh, this approach will, will reveal something interest, interesting. So what, what we can do next is actually compute the state of the, of the cavity after the whole operation. And for that, what I need to do is I need to express the new modes, the small modes of the cavity. I, I call them small u, and there is infinitely many of them, as a combination of, uh, of the modes before the uh, mirror has been introduced, which is a sum over all the modes from one to infinity, with some coefficient, I'm going to call them alpha, alpha mn, capital U of xt, and some other coefficient that I don't know yet, beta mn, that multiplies u star. And there is an index here missing, and the index here of x and t. And uh, Similarly, I can introduce the decomposition of the small u of xt as a sum of all the modes with alpha bar and m u and xt plus some beta coefficients m and u and star bar of xt. Okay, can I have a control question? Yes. So you have you have enlarged the Hilbert space by this mathematical operation because now you allow non-differentiable functions at the at the center, right? Effectively. Mm. At the midpoint. Because you, you, there is no correlation between the wave function on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. They're, they're free to, to, to be whatever they are. And because of that, um, and since there is no correlation, there is a bit more possibilities here. Well, well, okay, so what I'm saying is that, uh, no, no. Uh, I'm not that, saying it's bad, but just, just noting that- Oh, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's bad. I mean, everything you do in quantum theory is bad from the mathematical perspective. No, it's not, it's not just- It must be bad in some way, but what I, what I meant to say is that when you introduce the media, you actually change the boundary condition in the middle, and then you only allow this family of, 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 of modes. Now, if you are looking at the state in, that, in this part, on this part, everything will, every, everywhere apart from the, middle point, mm -hmm. then you need to express the state in terms of the previous state, because mm -hmm. actually nothing changed. You just have to re-express the old basis into new basis. And since this single point is inaccessible, then it doesn't really matter what happens in that single point. Yes, but this exactly means that you, you allow for a bit more functions than before. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just something to note, that you have a bigger effectively Hilbert function, which makes a difference. I'm sure it's bad. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not saying it's I'll bad. I'll be surprised it's it, 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 if, if, if Professor Urbanski from uh, mathematical uh, um, division of, of our uh, um, department would leave slamming the door. Uh, I'm sure of that. No, that's not just mathematical uh, nonsense. I also, think it makes a difference here. If I can say something, it's now the sum of two Hilbert spaces, the yes. one which corresponds to the left and uh, right. Uh, I would say it's not the sum, it's a tensor product of those. Or, or, okay, tensor product, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. but this is uh, essentially different Hilbert space. Yes, yes, yes exactly. So you, you, you actually have this, now the structure of Hilbert spaces becomes a tensor product. Now those coefficients can be, uh, those coefficients alpha and beta can be ca calculated explicitly by means of just multiplying both sides by, by ortho one of the mode of the orthogonal family and integrating or calculating the scalar product, and you can immediately obtain the result. Those coefficients alpha and mn are given by scalar products be between the previous, the, the old family of modes and the new family of modes. So just you have to compute scalar product and you get alpha, and similar, similarly you get beta. And uh, in this case, it's minus u n star 
comma um. And similarly, you can compute the coefficients for the BART region, which is mn, mn. These are the last formulas I'm going to use. I, I, I'll do the hand waving all the time. These are just the exceptions. Just, so just to, to be sure, the small u with index m, it is assumed that for x larger, so on the right of the barrier, is just zero. Yes, exactly. So, so, so the small mode, so the, so the product of Hilbert spaces is just yes. a function which is zero in some part of the space. Yes. And, so, so and the drawing would be, should be this, like the, the basic mode u1 is this and zero outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So I'm going to complete this, these formulas just to have them here and so that I, I can forget about them. That's the primary purpose of me writing here. Right. And these are this this fancy uh, set of, of writings is called Bogolubov transformation. It's something that is used across all physics, uh, not only in relativistic quantum field theory, but in solid state physics, quantum theory, everywhere. It's very uh, well known. Uh, I mean, way of expressing types of evolution of, of quantum systems. Uh, however, uh, it, what what is nice about this example is that those coefficients are very easy to compute. Because what we have here is just sine functions and cosine functions, perhaps nothing really fancy. So you can explicitly compute those coefficients. And uh, I lied to you. There is one more uh, uh, board, uh, line, um, board with formulas. I just want to, to give you the results so that uh, uh, so that you get at least a little bit of something else than hand waving. And that alpha coefficient, for example, can be computed explicitly, and is given by the following fascinating expression, one half of L squared omega one, if so, omega n times omega m. I'm gonna express the, explain the denotation in a second. And uh, m pi one half L minus one to power m times sine function of n pi over two, and n can be only odd for n that is even the coefficient is zero. And what is here is the length of the cavity, the initial length of the cavity that I called L. And we also have capital omega and small omega. And these are frequencies of modes corresponding to the big cavity and the small cavity. And these are given by the standard expressions. Essentially they are um, for, um, for a field that has a mass, for example, for a field that has a mass, omega n will be given by the square root of n pi over two, I guess. I'm citing from memory, plus mass of the field squared in some natural units. Uh, and that's the alpha coefficient. And beta coefficients are actually very simple. And these are proportional to alpha. And there is some proportionality constant that is given by the combination of frequencies, omega minus small omega over omega n plus small omega. Sorry, let me fix my terrible handwriting. This is an M. Right. So I just wrote this to show you that this is easy to compute and it's straightforward, nothing really fancy. Now, what is interesting here is that if betas are non-equal to zero and they are non-equal to zero because alphas are, are non-zero and betas are proportional to alpha, that already means that there will be particle creation. This is a well-known property of Vogelhoff transformation that says that if those coefficients beta are non-zero, that already indicates that there will be particle that created in the whole system. And that happens always whenever modulo squared of any beta for any index n or m is, is greater than zero. You have particle production. And actually, that's the case of the Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is actually the, the, the effect in which black hole evolves or collapsing start uh, collapses. And then from the vacuum appear particles. What Hawking did is essentially co computed coefficients of the Bergoglio transformation that corresponds to this whole effect. And he has shown that beta coefficients are non-zero. And in fact, modulo squared of beta integrated over all that one of the indices gives you the total number of particles that's produced. So uh, that's all he did, just computed a fancy Bogilov transformation. Uh, it was more difficult because in his case, the 
those coefficients were hard to compute. In our case, it's very easy to compute. But essentially, the, the mathematics is very similar. Now, uh, this is not the end, end of the story. We know that those particles are created and half of the box, half of the empty box is not empty. But more interestingly, if you go back to this picture that I drew at the beginning, those particles that are created in both sides of the box are actually entangled. And uh, this is more interesting. And the, I would like to talk about this entanglement a little bit now. But before I do, let us ask the question, how many of those particles are produced? So uh, uh, maybe this let me ask you a riddle. How many you think are produced in this process? Very and few. Here, yes. So sorry, say again, please. Very few. Uh, this is not true, quite opposite. So if you, if you count the number of those particles, if you actually compute betas and take a modulus square sum of the indices to get the total number of particles, the outcome is infinite. And if you think about it, I mean, you cannot expect that you have seven particles or 11 particles because 11 is not uh, a preferred number. I mean, how, what would prefer 11 from, from, from seven? Uh, so there are just two numbers that are natural already, zero or infinity in this problem. And this is not zero, so it's clearly infinity. Because no physics really pr prefers in, any number, any other in, number. Yeah, but in practice, there is one important parameter, namely the cutoff frequency of the walls. Oh, yes, of course. Of that, course. And that's really what is uh, setting the limit. And if you do it re realistically, then you will get a very small number. Oh, that is a, that in, in practice, it's, it's not only few, it's, it's my, much less than few. But exactly, in, this exactly. uh, in this idealized example, when everything is perfect, when mirrors are perfect, and also that third mirror appears instantaneously, the number that you get is infinite. So now let us discuss uh, why it cannot be infinite. So one possibility is that your mirrors are not perfect. Your cavity is not perfect, and then some of the most leak out, and then the whole scheme collapses. But let us not worry with some such practical difficulties. Let us assume that the mirrors are indeed perfect. But there is one more parameter that comes to, to mind that could make things finite. And that's the parameter that, oh, sorry, that parameter that discussed dictates the time at which the barrier is lifted. So if I, I have assumed that everything acts uh, instantaneously. But in practice, you cannot do such things instantaneously. There's always some time that it takes for the mirror to appear, right? It, that time has to be finite. And notice that the length of that the length of time that it takes for the barrier or the mirror to show up is small or big compared to something. And one natural scale that you can compare it with is the inverse of the frequency of some of the modes. For example, suppose that I can lift the mirror within a second. Then if the inverse of the basic mode of the cavity is inverse of the frequency is much less than a second, then that one second can be something very fast as compared to the typical oscillation time in the ground mode of the cavity. But as I go up and up the ladder of all the modes, at some point I will reach a mode of, su of sufficiently high frequency that the inverse of that frequency will be much shorter than the time of elevation of the, of the barrier. So for, su for su some high frequency modes, the time at which I introduce the mirror has to be very, very short, very, very, very long, and for some lower modes, it's going to be very, very short. So uh, effectively, for sufficiently high frequencies, the whole operation will effectively be adiabatic. Uh, because if it takes a second or microsecond to leave the mirror, then for sufficiently high frequency modes, microseconds is infinity. So those high modes will act as the evolution was adiabatic, while the modes that are below that uh, threshold will feel the evolution to be almost instantaneous. Uh, so that's why you have to introduce the cutoff in the summation of all frequencies. And that cutoff will be roughly at, at the frequency for which the evolution becomes almost adiabatic. And that's what will make everything finite. And uh, if you actually want the particles to be produced, the time at which you introduce the mirror has to be much shorter than the inverse of frequency of some of the modes in the cavity. And that's what makes it difficult. And that's why in practice, you have very few of those particles created because you cannot introduce the mirror 
sufficiently fast. So that now in, in practice, it is rather uh, limited by the cutoff uh, frequency of the mirrors yeah. because oh, they yeah. are transparent yeah. above some frequency, no matter what is the material that you are using. Of course, I mean, so, so there are practical limitations. So, so only in idealized case, but in the idealized case, if you are doing theory here, then in principle, half of the empty box is infinitely occupied with particles. I am sure you are aware what you are talking about is called dynamical Casimir effect, and there is of course hundred or more papers which study this in great detail. Yes, yes. Changes I, of the boundary conditions produces the dynamical Casimir effect. Absolutely. So, so the textbook definition of the dynamical Casimir effect is where you have a mirror and it accelerates through vacuum. No, and no, then, no, no, no. That's not true. Dynamical Casimir effect is a broad range of various experiments, including even something which does not correspond to your picture. Yeah, I, I'm, but by saying textbook definition, I, I meant a, a particular textbook. Uh, I'm sure there are other textbooks in which the definition is different. <laughs> so, yes, of course, I, I'm aware of, of all these things. But uh, so I discussed these things just to go to an interesting part of the whole disc of the whole effect, and I mentioned that those particles are actually entangled. So these particles are entangled, which you can quanti quantify in any measure you, you like. We have used in um, negativity uh, to, to quantify entanglement, and clearly those particles are really entangled among each other. And then uh, uh, one typical intuition that goes beyond it is, is, uh, is the following one. Well, you have modified the system. You have introduced some Hamiltonian, that's some sort of new interaction in the, in the system. And that local operation created entanglements locally and that those particles spread around and they carry the entanglement across the cavity. However, I would like to point out that this picture is not correct. And let me show you why. So. Uh, uh, give me a second. Uh, uh, okay, may maybe let me let me uh, before I do so. I, I I got confused. So these are the this is the paper I mentioned when I when we discussed these things uh, about the half of the box is empty or not. Uh, these are some 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 numbers where we compute the negativity between the modes and uh, uh, some technical details that are not so interesting. Uh, this is a simulation for of the uh, density of particles inside the box uh, after the uh, after some time has passed after the mirror has been introduced and here we have used some numbers we have introduced some cutoff to make things finite and uh, from the numerical numerical uh, simulations you can find that the uh, if the mirror is introduced here then the init initially the particles after soon after that occupy this area close to the mirror and that it becomes closer and closer as you increase the cutoff. But after a while, those particles move to the left. This is the left part of the box, and they move around in some uh, typical shape that looks roughly like this. But this is not the, the interesting part. The interesting part is when we ask something else. Suppose that we change our scheme a little bit so that not one, but two mirrors are introduced. So the new picture would look somehow like this. We have initial cavity, and then we suddenly introduce two mirrors. And again, the effect is similar. You will have some particle creation on both sides of each mirror. Those particles move to the sides, one to the left, one to the right. And as I said, those particles are entangled among each other. These are entangled to these, and these are entangled to these. What is interesting here, and what I would like to discuss with you here today, is that there is an extra entanglement that is far from obvious, that is that can be shown to exist between those two parts. So those particles on the left are indeed entangled with the particles on the right, which is far from intuitive because uh, you probably can point out correctly you have to that by doing two local operations in two corners of the universe, you cannot create entanglement. It's not allowed. To create entanglement, you, you cannot do it by just local operations and classical communication. 
there is a theorem in quantum information that prevents that. And yet, it can be shown here that there exists entanglement between those particles that is created immediately after the emitters have been introduced. And this is one of the examples of this crazy, I mean, strange property that appears here. And before I proceed with explanation uh, uh, or interpretation of this, I would like to point out yet another interesting work uh, um, that is quite similar to this one that was published in the early 20s. Also, this was not the first paper to, to treat this subject. I'm sure there were earlier papers on this. The paper by Resnik, Redsker, and Seelman, I think double L, in the 2000s, that considered the following scenario. They considered, again, a simple space-time diagram, and uh, they consider the situation in which there is a vacuum state of the field in all space. And in that vacuum, they introduce a single atom that appears at some point, starts to interact with the field, and the interaction ends here. So there is a finite time of interaction, and the atom started at the ground state. They consider the simple two-level system that they introduced, and that system introduced only locally with the field. There were no other interactions, interactions and local. But they also introduced a second detect, second atom like this, further away, somewhere here, that was also initially in the ground state and also interacted for a finite time. And what was important is that the interactions were separated causally. So the future light con of this interaction on the left-hand side and the future light con of the interaction of the right-hand side made sure that atoms do not talk to each other. They were separated causally. No signal could be transmitted either way within the time of interaction. And yet they have shown that the final state of the atoms here, when you take the state of the whole system, which is two atoms plus the field, trace out the field and look at the state of the atoms only, this state of those two atoms turns out to be entangled. which was puzzling. And many people objected to this, that it cannot be true. There was a big argument about this. And yet uh, history has shown that While they were the right. problem stated this way, it is gauge dependent. Because you have to specify, if you've got atoms introduced, you have to specify what sort of vacuum is prepared. Is it the so-called DE vacuum or PA vacuum? And the result will depend on that. I, as far as I remember, they, I mean, okay, I, I remember. They, they were not even looking at the electromagnetic field, but they considered a scalar field. It's a kind of toy model of electromagnetic field. And in that case, there is just a single vacuum. There is no ambiguities here. But also in the electromagnetic vacuum, I think for any vacuum, any type of vacuum, initially, the, there will be some entanglement afterwards created here between yeah, them. Yes, yes. But if the state depends on the choice of gauge, then I would not say that it's a physical uh, effect. Oh no, but uh, we are so we are looking at the state of the atoms. I mean, what that's are you right. saying? There is a, that's, right. A, that's right. A, if, that's right. And if it depends on what sort of vacuum you are starting from, and then if the if what I suspect the final state of atoms depends on that, then I don't think you it's a it's a, an ambiguous physical statement. Wait, wait, wait. So, so, sorry. First of all, when you talk about any field whether scalar or electromagnetic, electromagnetic, there is an ambiguous definition of what, what vacuum is. We are talking about inertial frame of reference. Everything is well defined. Right? No, if you have if you have sources, then it is not so uh, not true. But before you have any sources, you just initially ah, before, you have a... yes, yes. For the for the free field, I, I agree. But yeah. I'm, is a, we are talking field. about sources. No, but but we start with the free field and then introduce to charges and they interact for a finite time. That was the setting. Well, anyway, the conclusion of this, and is the same conclusion for, for our previous scenario, is in fact that it is true that you cannot create entanglement by local operations. So this clearly this entanglement could not be created in the process. It has to be present from the very beginning. And that whole scheme, in fact, shows that 
the vacuum state of the field is a complicated entangled state already. That the entanglement in the whole system was present from the very beginning in the vacuum state of the ground state of the cavity. And the ground state of the cavity is, a, is not, it's, it's far, far from, from something straightforward. It's a complicated structure. We know that from quantum electrodynamics that there are fluctuations and all, but even without going into full QED, you see that there must be some entanglement present in the system before you start interaction so that what you do with your operations is simply extract that entanglement and swap it to other degrees of freedom. So you swap the entanglement from the vacuum to, to, your, to, uh, to the particles that are created. So in fact, this whole operation does not, in fact, create entanglement. It reveals entanglement that is already present in the system. And that was also the case for the other scheme that I discussed, where uh, these atoms are not creating entanglement by interacting with, that, with the vacuum. They swap the entanglement, they harvest the entanglement from the vacuum and swap it to other degrees of freedom. And that whole phenomenon was called ent entanglement of the vacuum. There are many, many schemes showing that entanglement uh, that you can, you can actually reveal the entanglement. You can use it for practical purposes. And uh, those guys shown that this entanglement can be used to violate Bell's inequalities. So this is something very practical. Uh, and therefore, when you write something like this, in quantum information, this is a state of the qubit and it's uh, something as simple as possible. This is clearly an unentangled state. But when you talk about relativistic effects that involve quantum field theory, such a state is not a, uh, um, uh, it's not something, it's really far from being simple. It has a complicated structure and the structure of that entanglement is very, uh, well, it's not well understood to be honest yet, but certainly it carries some entanglement. But this is simply a statement that the vacuum cannot be defined locally. The vacuum must be yes. defined everywhere. You are Otherwise right. it's not a vacuum. You are, you are absolutely right. This is exactly the equivalent, equivalent to this. And for that reason, when you have the vacuum defined everywhere and you trace out just one region, if you trace out the region that you do not observe, what, you're, what you are left with has to have particles because by tracing out the vacuum, you are left with something else than vacuum and something else than vacuum is a state that has particles. And I mean, this is also a way to understand Hawking radiation really. You start with this, uh, with this uh, space that is deprived of any singularities. And after the star collapses, it forms an event horizon that separates a region of space that you have no access to. And that simply corresponds to the, in quantum me me mechanical language, that in order to, to characterize the state outside of the black hole, you have to trace out everything that is inside. And by doing that, you, you make the state of the field become not vacuum anymore. And that's why you create particles. That's the Hawking radiation. So these, these simple considerations with a simple cavity that is, slight, that is, that is uh, uh, divided into two by introducing a mirror, understanding this example uh, like uh, in a simple way allows you to understand more complicated cases like the uh, radiation of a black hole or, or stuff like this. And uh, mm, one, one final remark I would like to make about this, this whole scheme is that uh, we have asked other questions also on top of this one. For example, uh, if you go back to this first picture that we have here, uh, we have started with the vacuum state, right? But what if you start, started with something else than the vacuum state? Suppose that we have other state than the vacuum, maybe some excited state. And in fact, we have considered a very particular type of state and asked this question that we didn't know how to answer to initially. So suppose that we consider the two basic modes of the cavity, the ground mode and the first excited mode. And suppose that we introduce a state that has some entanglement between those two modes. Could be a two modes, squeeze state, for example, to make it simple because then uh, quantum optics allows you to use the tools uh, that are easy to, to, uh, to compute the entanglement that corresponds to it. And the question is, if we slam the mirror down in the middle, you create some entangled state. But the question is whether the entanglement between those two regions depends on the entanglement between those two modes. And we have considered two scenarios. One in which we have the entangled state between those two initial modes. And second scenario in which there was no entanglement between those modes, 
but those two modes were occupied by a mixed state that is the same as the one that you obtain by tracing out the entangled state over one of the degrees of freedom. So if you take the entangled state, take the marginal and trace out of one of the modes, you are left with a mixed state in the other mode. So what if we take the mixed state, put it here, and the other similar mixed state in the other mode, and compare to the case with that entangled state? So the question is whether the presence of entanglement between the, those two modes affects the presence of entanglement in the spatial degree of freedom. And we didn't know initially how to answer. I mean, you can just compute the answer and find out the results. But it's not obvious from the beginning what the answer should be. Actually, it's, I, if I was to bet, I would say that uh, this spatial entanglement should not depend on whether my states are vertically, so to say, entangled or not. And yet I was proven to be wrong. It turns out that there is entanglement between the uh, spatial degrees of freedom, and it depends on the, on the choice of the scenario, whether the states are initially entangled or whether you only have a mixed state of two modes that locally is indistinguishable from the entangled states of those, those, those modes. And so that's the paper uh, that we looked, on, looked into these questions, analyze that. And I think I more or less run out of time. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening and I'll be happy to discuss. Okay, so thank you for this talk. I'm sorry for this misprint in the title. We announced it uh, unfortunately incorrectly uh, with the minus sign. Now we have, we see that it's plus. So now we have time for questions, please. My question is that I do not quite see how do you divide this whole system into two subsystems before you do any calculations because the question of entanglement is a question that must be answered when you clearly define what are the two subsystems that are in an entangled state. Oh, uh, are we talking about which scheme, scheme entanglement between particles in the left and right hand side? No, no. At the beginning, when you had just one cavity, your system was a single system. Yes. Then you suddenly turn this into two subsystems. And this procedure is not quite clear to me at which point you decide that you really have two subsystems and you can talk about, say, the wave function of one subsystem and the wave function of the second subsystem and the product wave function, uh, which would be unentangled. And then how does this develop? Turning well, uh, into this one system into two subsystems. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, if you consider the idealized case when the mirror has been introduced at some time t, then epsilon after that already, the structure of the Hilbert space involves two subsystems. And that's when you can introduce unambiguously the this definition between the left one subsystem and the other subsystem, which is epsilon after the op operation has been finished. But if you do it suddenly, then there is really no relation between what happened before and what happens after. Oh, quite opposite. I would say that the relation is uh, uh, straightforward. Uh, uh, the state of the system after the operation has been performed is the same state that you have started with, only you have to express the state in a different basis. No, no, that's not quite true because at the beginning you had one system and then suddenly you have two subsystems and this transition is certainly discontinued. Yes, uh, and but but yet, but notice that if you if you are interested in the state within this part of this of the cavity, so not at the mi between the mirrors, then this state here cannot be affected by local, but by the operation that, that takes place outside of it. So the state of this part of the cavity is the same state of the of the cavity before the operation. So you are allowed to express this state, let me call it number two, in terms of what was here number one, because it's the same state. You just have to re-express it in a new basis. It couldn't have changed because you have done something locally here. What I'm talking about is that you can really discuss this. You can discuss this in terms of ordinary quantum mechanics. You have a wave function at the beginning, 
the wave function of the electromagnetic field, this object can be introduced. And then you suddenly change this wave function into two wave functions of two independent systems. Yes, I'm sure you can. Okay. And of course, this transition is discontinuous because you change one system into yes. two sub and many things can happen when you do such discontinuous changes. Physically, of course, you can also solve this problem. It's a linear problem with well-defined boundary conditions. You can study the evolution of the electromagnetic field quite well. Yes, I, I, I mean, uh, the way- uh, This is what he has done. Yeah, that's roughly what I have done. But but to address this this uh, concern, uh, one can ob obviously introduce a, um, a regularized model of the of the extra mirror, where it's being when the barrier is being lifted when a finite time. So, for example, I could switch on transparency of this mirror. I mean, I can sorry, I can start with transparent mirror here and then decrease transparency gradually within finite time. And in that case, I will be able to, to calculate what is the state of the uh, of the cavity after the operation is completed. But in that case, I will have to do it numeric, numerically, I believe. You, I, I, would, I wouldn't hope that it's possible analytically. And I also, I would suggest, I, mean, I, would, I would expect that the outcome will be in the limit of the time of interaction going to zero, uh, would gradually approach what I have just shown with the analytical calculation. So. Uh, you can regularize the model to, to, to make sure that it's not the effect of this being sudden. You can make it finite and then take go to zero, and I'm sure the limit is continuous. On this, I side with the speaker. Yeah. Could I have a similar comment? Yes, but uh, uh, maybe uh, first, uh, Mikola will ask the question because he raised his hand. Okay, so I just wanted to suggest a, a yet different way to regularize this problem, and which would which would lead to a very interesting. Uh, time model as well. What if you simply regularize the spatial dimension here? So just allow certain positions where the particle is, plus some kind of um, possibility of, of a kind of discretized Schrodinger equation with a, with finite number of sites and with a potential. And then you could you, you, this would introduce a natural cutoff on frequencies and would make the problem completely finitely dimensional. And then you could introduce the mirror just by introducing mm -hmm. an infinite, a large potential in the midpoint. Yes, yes, and, and I'm, I'm sure you can do it. And then I'm also sure that when you take the appropriate limits, mm -hmm. uh, you'll still retrieve this in a continuous way. So it just I, seems I, to, what I'm it saying just is that this is a simplified model, but it captures mm -hmm. the physics. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not introducing anything new that you wouldn't get in the regularized version of the, of the scheme. Mm. Well, what probably bothers some of the listeners is that all of a sudden there is this zero forced in the middle and perhaps the state before had non-zero value, but that only means that very high modes of half a box must be occupied because you've got to, to, to have in your disposal sign functions with very high frequency, with very high, uh, very short wavelengths to create locally at one given point a zero. Yes, yes, I, I, I think that's, 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 really, that's really one of the reasons why in this super idealized case, you are getting infinite number of photons. Exactly, so, so, so we are thinking about experiments and the practical limitations make the number really small. It's practically yes, yes. Very, 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 very small. <clears throat> I, I think there is one person in the universe, at least observable, that would be able to perform an experiment that would reveal these effects. Well, if, if they tried, uh, but we didn't uh, manage to, to convince them to do the experiment. It was just too costly. But he said it would be in principle possible. I so suggest if you if you have some time, just look at our old papers where all these estimates, how many, how or how few, how how little is 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 actually generated if you take realistic parameters. Okay, I, yes, I, I, I'll be happy to. Yes, Kirone is the other author. Okay, so Cirone, Professor Rzeczkowski, uh, Karol, you yes, had so a comment? Yes, is in a sense similar. So usually we discuss entanglement between two well-defined objects or subsystems like here we are, and usually it's static. Now, if we discuss changes of evolution of entanglement in time, or you assume that the splitting between two subsystems does not change, 
This is very important. Then it is a well-defined property. Or sometimes it could be a different scenario that you say, <coughs> ah, the splitting is different. Let's say I will take some part of this blue, sorry, yellow pen, and now treat this as a subsystem. But then it has to be somehow, of course, you can do it gradually. You can have some unitary rotations which define different splitting. Sometimes it's physically somehow allowed or justified, but then it has to be somehow explicitly mentioned what entanglement with respect to which two subsystem we are discussing. Yes, of course. And that's why I think I'm allowed to say that if you ask the question, suppose you have an empty cavity and you would like to know whether half of the cavity is entangled of the other, with the other half or not. Okay. The practical way to do it is to introduce the mirror that is exactly um, introducing that, that, that very by, by partition that, that I'm interested in. And then I can operationally look at the entanglement between the particles that, that are created. And that will be equal by definition to the amount of entanglement between the two halves of the vacuum state. Yes, but introducing the mirror somehow already affects the system. No, it does not. I mean, it's just explicitly introducing the, the bipartition that you are talking about. Mm. Well, there's something called sudden approximation that Carol, I'm sure you are teaching your students about, where you always assume that the state has no time to change. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's the idea. And But this discussion was ambiguous. I wasn't sure about this neither. And I, it was hard for me to convince my other colleagues that what I'm talking about is not creating the entanglement, but extracting it from the vacuum. And for that, I had this idea to introduce two mirrors and show that there is entanglement between the yes. two extreme regions. And you clearly cannot create that entanglement by just local operations. So the only way to explain this is to say that, oh, this entanglement has to be present from the very beginning. And this is, in fact, the entanglement between this part of the vacuum and this part of the vacuum. There's no other way. Okay, but it could be kind of apparent entanglement. Uh, you can you use say, the violent basic inequalities. Because of the structure of the uh, space in advance, before. But, this, but, but the structure of the space in advance is just, a, I mean, it's just a vacuum state. There is nothing there. It's, it, there is no structure really other than the vacuum, structure of the vacuum. Okay, thank you. So, 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 so this is counterintuitive and it's especially counterintuitive to, to quantum information community that thinks that ground state is just something trivial. Well, it's not. And uh, there are many schemes showing that algebraic quantum field theory is a way to show it uh, almost in a trivial way. This uh, uh, Ben Resnick, Retzker, and Silman paper has shown it explicitly with a simple toy model of the interaction. This is another way to show the same thing, but uh, and UNRU effect is another way to, to show the same thing. Also, Hawking radiation that we are now familiar with uh, that creates thermal particles outside of the uh, black hole is in fact, and those particles are in fact part of the entangled state, because if you are looking at the state of the inside of the black hole, it turns out to be entangled with the Hawking radiation. So it's the same, it's again, the same story. A Bogliot transformation will create entanglements, I mean, or reveal entanglement by just changing the, the composition of the, of the state. And operationally speaking, if you want to ask the question, how half of this, how this region is entangled with this region if everything is in the vacuum state, operationally, this corresponds to making that exact experiment to, to divide the, the, uh, the, the region into and to look at what is what what appears there and then quantify entanglement. That's operational, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just a comment, because, uh, well, my community are using Bogolibov approximation, Bogolibov transformation to stand excitations on top of both the Einstein, Einstein condensate. And then the Bogolibov vacuum is just their ground state or some approximation of the ground state. So if I would split BC into two parts, then I would have entanglement between excitations. On, on yes, this. exactly. Because, and the reason is very simple. A Bogolibov transformation corresponds to a unitary operation. And unitary operations can take pure states into pure states. 
So when you see a thermal state of the excitations of the, of the condensates, of the one of the half of the condensates, this mm -hmm. simply cannot be the whole state because thermal state is mixed. And a unitary operation cannot, cannot take a, 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 a pure state and turn it into a mixed state. The whole state has to be pure. And since one of the halves of the state is thermal, that means that the other half, half has to also be thermal and those two are actually parts of the entangled state. Mm -hmm. There is no other way because Buglos transformation is a, another way of describing a unitary operation. So now people are measuring quite precisely quantum depletion and things like that. So maybe this experiment can be done. It's yeah, not the absolutely. same because there's no really vacuum, vacuum, but mathematically it would be the same. Whenever you have a Buglos transformation, it reveals entanglement or just introduces entanglement, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. so, so if people are normally studying the excitations on just local uh, part of the, sub, on a subsystem, but there must be another subsystem which also has similar excitations and those two must be entangled. Krzysiek, mm -hmm. of course, the limitation is the way that they can split the BEC into two parts, which is never instantaneous and so on. So there are, of course, practical limitations to the simple calculation of the kind that, mm -hmm. that, that Andrzej Dragan was showing. But they can be quite quick, yes? That's right, but that's right. But, that will, uh, but typical... as, as we discussed, this will put the cutoff. Mm -hmm. But typical time scale for excitations like in milliseconds, and they yeah, yeah. can put the light sheet in, I don't know, 10 microseconds. Yes, 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 yes. But, but that, uh, the, what I said does not depend on the time of the operation. Whenever you have any type of evolution, whether slow or fast, that can be described by a Bogolev transformation, it's still a unitary operation. And unitary operations cannot create mixedness of the state. No, 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 no. No, the, the, the splitting is not the Bogolev transformation. Bogolubov things are the description of, of uh, excitations of, of the isolated BC. The splitting is another dynamical process which must be described by the, this famous gross pitaeski equation. Okay, so this is what I, what I meant by, by saying, let me, let me go back to the uh, drawing board. Mm. What I said is this, suppose that uh, we have, uh, let me go to blank page, right. I have, I have any quantum system, then it undergoes some sort of evolution and it goes outside of something else. And as long as this operation is unitary, and uh, suppose that you are using the second quantized picture where you have just some quantum field here and this other state of the quantum field, this whole operation is unitary, which means it has to keep the states, the purity of the states unchanged, right? And this unitary operation can be equivalently characterized by a Bogolyov transformation, which transforms the creation and annihilation operators into something else, a linear combination of those. And the descriptions are equivalent. So if your Bogolyov transformation creates local excitations that look like a thermal state, but you have started with a pure state, there is no other way. There has to be other thermal excitations and those must be entangled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you trace out part of the system, because there is also another thing that, uh, as Professor Zanzeski mentioned, that uh, uh, your system may, may not be perfect. Maybe, maybe there's some leakage outside. So if, if you are looking only at the part of the system and trace out something else, that is a possible source of other. Um, um, in, and this, this also can introduce mixedness. But uh, in principle, the states of the system after the operation is pure. And therefore, it's not possible that you create some thermal excitations out of a pure state. There must be entanglement somewhere. And experimentally speaking, it's usually much more difficult to, to find that entanglement. It's easier to find excitations than entang that entanglement, but in principle, it should be possible. Can I ask the scientific science fiction question? Yes, sure. Uh, you said that the Hawking radiation is entangled. Yes. With something which is inside the black hole. Yes. So by manipulating the particles of the Hawking radiation, which is, which presumably is plenty of them in the universe, we can manufacture, we can manipulate things inside of the black hole. No. Well, no, 
because if you, if, you... if I have a entangled particles and I do the experiment on one of them, I do the ex the same thing. The other one part of it must rip. Okay, so so, so 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 the basic theorem of quantum information is that whatever operation you perform here on a pair of entangled states, it does not change any local experiment that you can perform here. So if if I only can perform local experiments on the but left hand side, state, but but the, this other state feels then the operation. The, the global state does. But if I only have access to the uh, by uh, part of the states, then I won't be able to detect any effect of that operation onto onto left hand side. So whatever I do on the right, that does not affect anything locally on the left. It affects the global state. And that's why you cannot send the information uh, superluminally, because uh, if, if you could uh, manipulate by manipulating was... this, you would be able to send superluminal information, and you cannot do that. So, but anyway, it's a nice way of writing a science fiction story. Uh, that's definitely. I had another idea, and uh, uh, I discussed it with. Um, so, I gave a talk uh, um, a while, while ago about an idea that uh, you could actually start with a state that is different than uh, than the vacuum and uh, consider the black hole collapsing star scenario. And I have calculated that in principle it should be possible to to discriminate between the case where your part of the state outside of the black hole is entangled with the inside or not. So you cannot look into the black into the inside of the black hole and uh, and uh, uh, it's not possible, but you are able, I thought it was possible to detect entanglement across the event horizon. And I gave a talk and uh, Roger Penrose, who was there, he was very excited about this and we had a long discussion about that. That was before he got the Nobel Prize. And then I realized it's completely wrong. <laughs> I was wrong about this. But uh, maybe maybe I, I, I was wrong with the calculation, but may, maybe the idea is still possible. So the the question is whether it is possible to detect whether the, there is entanglement across the bipartition or not by only studying the local properties of the state, uh, which would be interesting, but uh, but also sounds uh, strange. So I, I don't know about that. I think we have to finish because there is somebody that wants to ask the question. Sorry, and he wasn't had didn't have a chance. And just... yes, the star Hunli. Uh... So maybe the last quick question, Tai, can you proceed? Yeah. Uh, I try to understand uh, uh, the entanglement uh, process because uh, when you actually, when you talk about actually entanglement, uh, we have to consider two independent system. So if we uh, specially divide actually the two region, and then my uh, and then we try to consider the entanglement between two different modes. Uh, so I and my concern is actually right. it is two two different actual space region um, may not be actually independent or it's obviously independently actually separate uh, by. Uh, splitting to space. Well, but what do you mean they are not independent? You have an ideal mirror, which is perfect, which perfectly separates those two. So in mathematical terms, the Hilbert space is a product, tensor product of the two, two Hilbert spaces. So they are independent in this idealized model. The only way that makes it, and that, that the only way to introduce the entanglement is that the state of the system is entangled. So there is some entanglement between those two subsystems and it's present from the very beginning. That's the only way to introduce this independence, this kind of dependence of those or correlation between the regions. But the space itself is perfectly separated. So in this idealist scenario, you assume that there is no link. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's thanks to Dragan for the talk. <laughs>